Jane Perot. Now this is my podcast and my passion. It's On The Edge, the show all about the plants that beautify our homes, empty our purses and make us very happy people. And this week I'm talking to a chap they've called the Wiz Kid of Wisley. That's Matthew Pottage, who is curator at one of the best known gardens in the UK, the Royal Horticultural Society's Wisley Garden in Surrey. So he's got a big passion for outdoor plants, but not everyone knows that he's also really keen on indoor plants too. I got the chance to hang out in his office and meet some of the plants in person and find out why he had two of the biggest schlumbergeras I'd ever ever seen sitting on top of his filing cabinet. And we've got a question about a floppy Caleria. Now, if you've never heard of Caleria, it's a member of the Gesneriad clan, and we'll be finding out more about this brilliant plant and how to stop it getting leggy later in the show. I've been delighted to welcome a whole new clutch of patrons to my show since last week. That's Rachel, Tommy, Corrie, Kelly, Pam, Stephanie, Jordan and Brenda. Thanks to every one of you for supporting the show. If you'd like to find out more about how to support On The Ledge financially, do go and take a look at patreon.com forward slash on the ledge. Or just click on the Patreon link in the top right hand corner of my homepage to find out more. It's a way that you can unlock extra content to enhance your plant knowledge and get deeper into our lovely plant community. And one of the great things about Patreon is it's allowing me to do extra new stuff for my listeners. And when I reach my first Patreon goal, I decided to do a Facebook Live to celebrate. And that happened last week. Monday. If you missed it, then you can catch up by watching it again on my Facebook page, which you'll find at On The Ledge Pod. In it, I talked about some of my favourite houseplant books. I also answered a fair few questions on a whole range of topics and also had a little chat with those watching about the possibility of setting up a houseplant Facebook group for all of you to share your plant pictures and questions. Now, we've already got the On The Ledge Houseplant Sew Along Facebook group. So my question to you is, should I expand the remit of that page and make it a general houseplant group for everyone who listens to the show? Or should I set up a new page for general houseplant chat? I'd love to know your thoughts on that. I'll try to make a decision in the next few days so that you can all start contributing your chat and advice and pictures. Anyway, without further ado, it's time to get on with my chat with Matthew Pottage. After a tour around Wisley Garden, which is gorgeous, I do recommend a visit if you can. The glass house in particular is a complete delight to anyone who's into houseplants. And I will be posting some videos of what I saw on YouTube shortly. We sat down in his office to take stock of his extensive houseplant collection. We're here in your office, which... It's a fairly standard office in a beautiful building, but what makes this office amazing is your collection of houseplants, and it's great to meet a fellow enthusiast. You've got this lovely, is this Pothos Enjoy on here, or whatever whatever many multiple names it's been called? I know, yeah. I mean, is I'm, that what it I, got, I think is? it was Skindapsis, is now Epipremnum. Yeah. Uh, the variety name. Oh, I think I think it's I think I bought it as Enjoy, okay. <laughs> which is a terrible name. But I love the way you've got it climbing up your angle poise lamp, which is awesome. It's fun, isn't it? The health and safety manager's not seen it yet, but uh, <laughs> we go along with it for the moment. But yeah, it's all over the desk, like going through the PC. Uh, and I just you know I wouldn't be without my house plants, and I'm. Obviously, we're blessed with two windows in here. It is north-facing, but it's still light enough to have a, a huge array of plants in here. And, yeah, it's just it's so much... I spend too much time at the desk, so if I'm going to be at the computer, I still want to be mm. surrounded by plants. So, obviously, you're a, you're a horticulturist. You're doing wonderful things at Wisley, but you're also into house plants. Has that been a lifelong interest it has yeah so my grandma who i got my love of plants off actually was really into her house plants uh she had loads of pelagonians actually which uh i tend not to have so many of those but cacti and succulents and at an early age you know 
I could collect houseplants in my bedroom windowsill. Houseplants are so accessible for everybody. Uh, I was lucky. I did grow up with a garden. But, you know, if you didn't grow up with a garden or you don't have a garden now, you know, anyone can do houseplants. So, yeah, there was something that I kind of maxed out on and have continued to have an interest in. And it's exciting for me. I'm sure it's the same for you now that everyone else is getting into houseplants, that suddenly these things that were seen as a little bit odd in the past now, everyone's coming into your office and being excited I guess. Is yeah, yeah. It's you know what? It's really fascinating because um, we had we had some uh, uh, a team, a company helping us with some of our brand and marketing, and I had a couple of of young guys come. I think their office is in central London, and they must I don't know, both in their early twenties, and they reacted way more to the houseplants in here in a positive way than maybe some of the older visitors that would come here. Or if I do get a comment, it was, yeah, I had a cheese plant, you know, years ago. I had one of those years ago. So, and I, I, I have a similar feeling with some of, like, you know, the heathers and conifers, uh, which we, we champion here. We've got the National Collection of Heathers. And when people say, oh, you know, I remember them the first time around, it's like, well, I, actually, I don't. And, you know, some of the team here don't. So, actually, it's like, well, we haven't seen that before. We haven't done that before. Yeah, OK, it happened before, but we're using them differently now. And... And I think it was probably the same for a lot of, um, you know, people in their early 20s, millennials, younger folk that are into houseplants. They don't remember them the first time around and they're doing it their way and they're enjoying them. And things like the Calatheas, the Marantas, uh, the Monsteras, it's great that they're having this new lease of life. And I am glad to see also that you, you like your variegated plants. We've got a variegated Phalaenopsis here, which I've never seen before. <laughs> um, and your variegated... Um, is that an Easter cactus? My mind's gone blank. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a Christmas it's, cactus. Christmas cactus. Schlumbergera, yeah. Which uh, is a novelty in itself. What is that plant in the corner behind your Sansevieria, though? That's Is that um, this, a fern of some kind? It is, kind? it is. It's a type of asplenium with a cut leaf, uh, which is taking over there, which is so pretty. And then nestled in next to that Sansevieria is a, a variegated agave bracteosa, which is completely soft, no thorns, there's pretty white margins. And it was actually a present of the lovely uh, Helen Dillon. And I was visiting her garden in, in Dublin and spotted it in a glass house. And I said, oh, my God, I've never seen a variegated one of those before. And she's like, take it, have it. You know, if you like your variegated plants. And I don't have space for it anymore. I said, no, you don't need to give it to me. So she did, <laughs> very sweet of her. And, you know, it's lovely when a plant comes with a story like that and, and that will sit on there and remind me of that visit, which was, which was really cool. And you wrote recently a whole feature about Sansevierias for the RHS magazine, The Garden, and you it's not just any Sansevieria you've got here, it's this lovely Bantle sensation, which is really stunning. It's lovely, isn't it? Yes. Uh, it was fun to write that piece, and everyone knows the Sansevieria, I think Laurentii, the, you know, the more regularly seen one with the yellow variegation. But it was really nice to, to highlight other cultivars, other species, and it's a bit of a a catch-22 with some of that because sometimes you highlight plants that are actually difficult to get hold of and then you know a man wrote to me saying how silly to do an article on plants we can't get hold of but you know they are difficult to obtain they're not impossible to obtain but sometimes you need to highlight these more unusual things to bring them to people's attention and then when people start asking for them at the the garden centers you know the demand picks up you know how it works and and on the back of that article, actually, our plant centre do have a lovely range now of Sansevierias, and they are selling really well. So, oh, well, that's interesting. It's, it's I think cool. you're right. I think that's the thing. It's it's if you plant that seed in somebody's mind, then if anyone is a plant addict, they will then go looking and asking, and then yeah. that's how garden centres and nurseries know what people are after. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. And there's one of the ones that I featured in the article called Twisted Sister, which has got mm. lovely spindly. Uh, twisted leaves and I got that from uh, it was a British Cacti and Succulent Society raffle years ago <laughs> at, at Church Hall and you know it's out and about but and I've had my plant for years but it was just to showcase like you know there's there's more to them than just mm. the old Laurentii that you see around mm. <laughs> um, now what else did I want to ask you about uh, so you've got these two amazing Schomburgers here which have been donated to Wisley does that happen a lot where somebody's had a plant that they just don't can't look after anymore because it's too big or too old or Yeah, quite often and it's quite a sweet thing. Often it it can be house plants. It's typically cacti and succulents actually that someone's had for years and years and years and they've wrote to us and said, you know, we just don't have the heart to throw it away. And we can't always say yes because sometimes, you know, it's either really well represented in the collection 
And, you know, we could fill that glass house 10 times over we have here. But uh, these two particular ones that are sitting in here today, uh, about 35 years old, and a lady wrote to me and she said, we're having a house renovated. We, we can't keep these anymore. Uh, would, would you take them on? And, and they're so special because of the size and the age. We do have a, quite a lot of Schlumbergers in the glass house, but I said to the lady, you know, they might end up in a couple of big pots in our library or in the laboratory building in the foyer. And, you know, she was just delighted that they wouldn't go in the bin, really, in the compost. So, uh, yeah, they're going to be rehomed from here, but uh, they are dominating the office at the moment, and they are enormous. <laughs> and um, they're, one of them is situated just above your bookshelf. What houseplant books do you uh, like to have as reference for your houseplant interests? Are you like me... Uh, Dr. David Hesse on well, you know um, what, aficionado. That, yeah, it's still... I've got the houseplant expert and the indoor plant spotter. Mm. And, you know, they're good. They're good photo guides. They've got, you know, the, the naming's quite good. Uh, I do have Terry Hewitt's old Cacti and Succulents book. Uh, I do have the lovely one, I think it's Plant Love by Alice Fowler because I did a review on it, so that's sitting on there. And... Uh, yeah, I still I, I like to look at the old cultivars and still just reference back. And obviously, I think some of those older retro, the Hessian books are more 80s and 90s, but there's so much of those plants are now coming back in vogue. Totally. And it's actually amazing how few plants aren't in there. When you actually look, you realise that there's very few things that have been introduced uh, that, mm. that are not in those books. Mm. I mean, I can't remember if, you know, Zamio Colchis is in there. I think it, I don't think it is, actually, because I think I checked recently, but that's probably one of the few plants that's come in yeah. since then that's yeah. really big. And yeah. I think, right. turning around now, yes, you've got the lovely Cultivar Raven, which yeah. is um, yeah. the dark-leaved version. Yeah. How is that doing for you? It's such an easy plant. They're great, aren't they? I mean, yeah. Zamio Colchis, I only got to know, I don't know, five, six years ago, and I was mentioning to you before the difficulties of keeping plants going in our catering outlets, and the Zamia Culcus are really good. They sit in there with the aspidestras, dragged into the sun one day, dragged into a dark, shady spot. Somebody sits on it, the chair falls on it, and they're remarkably tolerant. That raven, because I'm on a north-facing windowsill, isn't looking very full, and it's not grown much since I've had it, but I'm hoping if we ever get some sunshine, that's going to start uh, doing something a bit more active. But yeah, you're right with the introductions thing. I mean, we, you know was looking at the variegated Swiss cheese plant before in the glasshouse, which is really sought after at the moment. But yeah, that's in the old Hessian books. It's nothing new. It's been kicking around forever, but <laughs> I guess not in big numbers. Yeah. And, and that is interesting just with variegation, isn't it? Because I think with some people, they're such purists, they can't cope with any. And then you have people like, oh, we can cope with hostas and, and clean margins. And then when you get splashed leaves, streaky striations... It's just too much for some, I think. Yeah, I think, yes, it's interesting. I think variegation is only going to get more uh, prevalent. I've seen recently variegated uh, peace lilies, yeah. which seem to be very popular in the States, but not coming over here yet. Uh, and, you know, that's such a common plant, but it's interesting that we haven't seen much variegation there before. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the more the merrier I guess is my view I'm sure one day we'll all suddenly go back to being to pure green and appreciating that but you know hopefully as more and more people get into plants and taking pictures of plants to put on Instagram you can see why a variegated leaf is going to is going to appeal um, and yeah I mean your office is a great example of of how to do it and you've got an African violet which weirdly although I I'm a big fan of Gisneros generally I've been very funny about African violets I have this <laughs> And you've got a variegated yeah, variegated of course. <laughs> which is doing an incredible kind of like um, balancing act. I like um, it's. <laughs> It needs watering, actually. It's a balancing act between life and death for it at the moment. Yeah, well, it needs a good drink. <laughs> well, that's the, the nature of all of these plants is, is, you know, you can let them go right to the brink. Yeah. And it's probably better for them to be doing that given how they grow in the wild. But it's, I'm, I've just got my first gone back into St. Paulie's and I've gone miniature I've got one of the very oh, tiny yeah. Yeah. one called Max Black Jack which I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to turn out but it's quite a nice miniature plant that was one of my tips actually at this event I did last week was miniature plants becoming mm. in um, I don't know if I, that's whether I'm in clown cuckoo land but I mean it's lo all these monsters and things that like you've got in here they're lovely but if you've got a tiny windowsill and that's all yeah 
I can see the appeal of those really tiny plants. Yeah, plants. I can too. There's a lovely one, I think it's actually in one of the Hessian books, called Pipsqueak, a tiny little San Paolo, and it's so cute. Mm. Yeah, and you can imagine if you're in a small apartment and you don't have lots of windowsill space, mm. uh, it, they're perfect and they're not going to yeah. outgrow the space. And, yeah. and slow-growing house plants like the Sansevieria, they are useful because you know it can sit in the same pot for years. And you know, despite how this office looks today... Uh, and being a houseplant lover, I don't like to see everywhere cluttered with plants. So, and, and if you don't want to keep potting something up to the point where it takes over the room, I also understand that. So, finding something that's manageable is, yeah, it does have its benefits too. Any Sansevieria tips? Is there anything? Propagation is is big right now. How do you pro- do? You like to propagate uh, Sansevieria, and do you uh, get into that propagation? business in your own time I'm sure you're yeah. busy doing it at work but I mean yeah. is that something that you yeah I, I find it fascinating well one thing I am always I'm quite I have to be kind of restrained and think if I'm going to split and divide something what am I going to do with it am I giving them away do I want more of them because you know I could divide that bantle sensation up and it's just like well what will I do with another 10 plants I'll probably <laughs> give you one if you wanted one but uh, yeah, you just have to think, well, you know, what would you do with it? Uh, with some of those variegated Sansevierias, they, they don't always, well, they don't come true from leaf cutting. So to keep that characteristic, it is a division. Mm. Whereas, I mean, it would root from the leaf cutting, but then it loses its uh, variegation and you have right. just the trifasciata. So, uh, which is, I guess, why maybe some of them are harder to come by because it really needs micropropagation. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Is there any plants I haven't talked about in here? I'm just searching around, what, see what, what else you've got. And I think that's... No, yeah. I'm, I'm making it sound like you haven't got many plants, but it is... This fal- this variegated Phalaenopsis is interesting. What's this, where did you get that oh, one That from? is crazy, isn't it? So there is... I mean, on Facebook, there is a variegated orchid group. It may even be a variegated Phalaenopsis group. And lots of the pictures of the interesting plants there, I think, are in, in Japan. And believe it or not, so that, I was walking through High Street, Kensington, I peered into M&S through the window where there's all the flowers and plants, and I just noticed this bright yellow leaf, and I thought, what earth is that? And I was just on the way to lunch and was running late, and I said to me, the half, I have to go in there and buy that plant, and he's like, oh no, not again, oh come on. There's just orchids, They've, you know, like any of the Phalaenopsis, you can buy them at petrol stations now. And it was just among a mix, a batch of different Phalaenopsis. Of course, it was the only variegated one there. The flower was going over on it at the time, so it was reduced, and I think it was a fiver or something. Uh, so was that so, just an aberration? I mean, was that supposed to be... Do no, you think it wasn't. It, was just, it just, just slipped through just the net, through I guess. Net. Wow. Um, and I guess maybe, maybe one of the growers thought when it was coming... I, I imagine it came from Holland originally. I don't know where they buy their plants from, but you can imagine either someone not noticing it or thinking that'd be fun when a planty person spots it mm. and it'll be someone's pride and joy and maybe other people will just think it's ill <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah it's very generous big uh, yellow bandings and again it's always interesting just how people react to that when they come in the office because I have you know loads of the garden staff come in here and other visitors and some people go whoa or some people go oh my <laughs> god oh, why are you making space for that there is there is a big split I think between those who would appreciate that and those who would find it um, deeply offensive yeah uh, yeah I, I'm just fascinated by by all of that so I think it's 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 something to be appreciated. It's a curiosity for sure, but it's it's doing something, and it's got beautiful flowers as well. So yeah, what's not to like? I'm wondering whether flowering, other than orchids, whether flowering house plants are going to have their day more. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting into back into Achimenes and oh, yeah. areas and things yeah. like that. Um, but they don't seem to be so popular in terms of what's going on on style-wise. No. Perhaps I'm still out of step. No. no, I think you're right. And I was I was doing an internal document, actually, for the RHS on house plants and offices because we're, you know, we are having more plants throughout our offices, which is really cool. And I was doing, you know, some top tips on foliage plants and ones to try. And then I was thinking, flowering plants, you know, what good, easy flowering plants? Spathiphyllum is a classic, Clivia is. But then some of those, you know, you look in the Hessian book, the shrimp plants, the justicia, the lollipop plant, Pakistakis lutea, they're fun and they're good too, but I don't think they're not having their moment, you know, right now. They're not available so much. Mm. You, you're going to come across a load of different echeverias and aloes before you see something mm. like that. So, yeah, maybe they're going to... Maybe that's going to come next. That's my hope. That is, that is all I can hope for. And I'm just also admiring this very nice copper... Um, is that a watering can or is it's, that... It's my is, water is your, jug, yeah. It's, 
In fact, this is very timely because I was on eBay googling copper watering cans oh, right. the other day. Yeah. Um, because and and it's actually amazing that that again something my parents had were you know and I sort of would obviously look at, a few years ago looked at snootily and now it's all back in fashion. Yeah, it is. I um, fill up every morning and it makes me drink water through the day. And if yeah. there's anything left in it. Some you lucky nearby plant. plants. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's the St. Polio's turn tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, it's you, you, yeah, you're not going to kill that through underwatering, are you? That's the, that's the good thing. No, exactly. Thanks so much to Matthew for his hospitality at Wisley. And if you missed any of the plants that Matthew and I were talking about in that interview, do check my show notes at janeperone.com where I've put a list of all the plants we mention. And now question of the week, which comes from Jennifer Weinzel, who's got a question about choleria. So this is a plant that is part of the Gesneriad family, as I've already mentioned. It's spelt K-O-H-L-E-R-I-A. And they're known for their beautiful flowers. They're Sorry, the dog's jumping on the couch. They're known for their beautiful flowers, often speckled in a variety of different kind of citrus shades of red or orange or yellow. And they can grow quite large, anything from about 15 centimetres, that's six inches, anything up to about a few foot tall, which could be, well, about a metre high. And Jen says, I obtained a tiny propagated Bristol's Possibly Bronze, which is a cultivar of Caleria, from a woman during the winter months and have watched it turn from a speck of a thing to a decent sized plant with flower buds. One of the buds has just fully bloomed and several more are in the process. The issue I have is how weak the stem is. Is this normal in this variety, perhaps? There is only one main stem which also concerns me. Any tips or experience with Caleria? Well, I'm in about the same position as you, Jen, perhaps a little bit further behind. My Caleria that I bought as rhizomes from Dibley's, the nursery in North Wales in the UK, earlier this year are sprouting, but they're not at the stage of flowering yet. But I'm sure that I'm going to be having some great success with this plant because I do love my Gesneriads, as any of you who listen to the show regularly will know. This family involves plants like St. Paulias and Streptocarpus, Cheritas, a.k.a. Primulinas, and they're really quite easy to look after provided you don't overwater them. And you can buy these plants often as tiny rhizomes that have kind of covered with scales. They look a bit like a brown furry caterpillar um, and the plant will then sprout from that. So you can buy them quite cheaply via mail order and then get a beautiful plant as a result. Or if you've got a friend with one, you can ask them to divide their pot and take some rhizomes from there. The downside of the Caleria is that, as I've already explained, some of them can get quite tall. But the good news is they take really well to being hacked back. And in this case, that's exactly what I do with Jennifer's Bristol's possibly bronze. I've seen a few pictures of this plant and it's really rather beautiful with bronzed leaves and bright red tubular flowers with a yellow throat and speckling inside. I suspect what's happened to here, Jennifer, is that your plant has put up one good stem, but encouraging it to put out new stems will probably involve hacking back that main stem, which will be brutal and it may remove some flowers temporarily, but it will encourage bushiness and these plants really will respond to that kind of treatment. So don't be scared give it a good hack back, maybe allow it to flower for a little bit and then give it a good hack back and you should find it becomes a more compact plant and you also get more stems forming on the same plant. I did find out from one source, which is a site called The Violet Barn, which is a US mail order company for Gesneriads, that the foliage on this plant only turns dark and showing this bronze colouring when the pH of the water is right. So you may find that actually for you, it doesn't show that bronze coloration. And I'll include a link in my show notes to the Violet Barnes Caleria page, which does give some good advice about how to grow these plants and emphasises they are fast, vigorous growers and don't be squeamish about cutting them back. So there you go. That backs up my advice. I'm also going to post a link to the very useful piece from the Gisneriad Society publication all about Calerias which emphasises some more of the essential care tips. And it does emphasise that one of the things that keeps Calarias more compact is good light, bright indirect light. So it may be that as the growing season goes on and the light becomes stronger and the days become longer, the, the plant will actually naturally bulk up as it does get more light. And if you prefer to start off with a plant that's naturally compact, try YF's Emma 
My only other advice is, as with most Gesneriads, make sure that you don't splash the leaves with water as this will mark them. So water from below if you can, or be very careful with your watering can spout to position it accurately so you don't splash the leaves. There are loads of incredible cultivars of this plant and they all seem to have great names. I found one on eBay called Coleria Blizzard's Prickle Puss. Seriously? <laughs> and Dibley's has varieties called Anne's Nagging Macaws, which is pink, maroon and yellow. Flush Dance, and one of the ones that I'm growing, which is called Sunshine, which is a beautiful bright pink. Well, I hope that helps with your Caleria, Jennifer. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me an email, on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. If you can include a picture and as much information as possible about your plant, that would really help. And just a quick reminder that the April newsletter will be coming out very shortly. I know it's rather late but it means that you've still got time to sign up before the newsletter comes out. You can do that by visiting my homepage, janeperone.com, and clicking on the newsletter link. Also check on the show notes for this episode, episode 46, for details of public appearances I'm making this year, including the Hampton Court Palace Flower Show and Gardener's World Live. I know, you'll be sick of the sight of me soon, won't you? I must now go and eat trifles, so I shall leave you with one thought. When life gives you lemons, just cut those suckers open, grab out the seeds and start germinating them. See you next week. Goodbye. heard in this week's show was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, Rasham Pidati Pokara by Samuel Corbin, and O'Mallory by Josh Woodward, all licensed under Creative Commons. See my website for details. <laughs> <laughs>